Hello, I'm Linor Moudou in for Esther Gitoui U World. Welcome to Africa 54. Here is what's coming up. Senegal's ruling coalition candidate Amadou Ba concedes defeat to opposition candidate Basiru Diomai Fai. In Zimbabwe, nearly 3 million people face food insecurity, with the worst expected as the dire effects of an ongoing drought still to come. And U.S. election campaigns are gathering momentum as President Joe Biden campaigns on his health care record, while his political rival Donald Trump focuses on his court troubles. All this and much more coming up on today's Africa 54. We begin our broadcast in Senegal, where the ruling coalition candidate Amadou Ba has congratulated his rival, opposition candidate Basiru Jomai Fai, for winning the presidential election. Early results from Senegal's presidential vote had put Fai ahead, sending his supporters into the streets to celebrate. Africa 54 managing editor Vincent Makore has more. Early signs from Senegal's presidential vote on Sunday put opposition leader Bizarro Diomaye Faye ahead, drawing his supporters to Dakar streets to celebrate. Millions took part in a peaceful day of voting to elect Senegal's fifth president. It followed three years of unprecedented political turbulence that sparked violent anti-government protests and buoyed support for the opposition. Many people are already celebrating. At least five of the nearly 20 candidates in the race have congratulated Faye as results are slowly trickling in. Voters decided on who will replace the outgoing president, Macky Sall, who is stepping down after a second term marred by unrest in one of West Africa's more stable democracies. The incumbent was not on the ballot for the first time in Senegal's history. Vincent McCory, VOA News, Washington. The United Nations Security Council on Monday passed its first resolution calling for a Gaza ceasefire after four failed attempts. The United States abstained, allowing it to pass. The resolution, backed by 14 nations, including China and Russia, demands an immediate ceasefire during Ramadan and the release of all hostages. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is meeting with Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant one day at the State Department here in Washington. Blinken met with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and other Israeli officials last Friday in Tel Aviv in an effort to secure a six-week-long ceasefire between Israel and Hamas in exchange for the release of hostages seized in the October 7th terror attack. Blinken reaffirmed the Biden administration's opposition to Israel's plans to launch a full-scale attack on the southern Gaza city of Rafah, where millions of Palestinian refugees are sheltering in makeshift tents. Gallant is also expected to meet with Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, CIA Director William Burns, and White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. Four men accused of staging the Russia concert hall attack that automatic weapons killed at least 137 people have appeared before a Moscow court. All four suspects were charged with terrorism. They showed signs of severe beatings and one appeared to be barely conscious during the hearing. A court statement revealed two of the suspects accepted their guilt in, assault, in the assault after being charged in the preliminary hearing. The court ordered that the men, all of whom are citizens of Tajikistan, be held in pre-trial custody until May 22nd. Russia observed a day of mourning Sunday. Rescue teams are continuing to search the scorched building for survivors as some families still agonize over the fate of their loved ones. The Islamic State terror group has claimed responsibility for the attack. The World Food Programme says Zimbabwe is at the peak of its lean season, with 2.7 million people across the country facing food insecurity. And that's before the effects of an ongoing drought kick in. Columbus Mabunga reports from Mangwe, one of the most affected districts. In southwestern Zimbabwe, crops in the Mangwe area have withered away. Even local farmers will be among Zimbabweans who need aid until 
next year. That includes 42-year-old Singazi Sibandam, a mother of three children. All my crops were burned by the sun. I don't know how we will get to next year and where we will be. The crops died at early stages. Mangwe is one of the districts in Zimbabwe most affected by drought. Local officials say some people may have to go work in nearby Botswana or in urban areas to survive. Boreholes have no water. Dams are drying up. There is no grazing grass for animals. Maybe some hay will be brought from other areas to feed the local animals. Food is being distributed in hard heat areas. Evelyn Lovo is the Minister of Matabele and South, also in the Mangwe area. She says the government is in touch with international aid agencies to get more help. Officials say the crisis is growing worse in the region due to recurring droughts caused by the El Nino weather pattern. The crop situation in Zimbabwe uh, is very poor at the moment, and we expect that the number of people who will not have adequate stock from their own production to last them until the next harvest, which would be then by the middle of next year, um, that that number of people who will not be able to meet their food needs over that full period will go up. Zimbabwe's government says the 2024 grain harvest will yield about 868,000 tons of grain, an alarming 62% drop from last year's total and far below the target that officials had set for this year. Aid groups say they are stepping up efforts to help. We're focusing on this January to March period, which we have identified is the peak of the lean season. It's the most critical period. But as you're mentioning, it's also important for us to provide additional opportunities so that even throughout the year, people have options and means to support their families and households. A message that brings some hope to people like Zimbabwe. Meanwhile, Zimbabwe's information minister says the country is working to ease food insecurity by waiving taxes on the importation of rice, maize, potato seed, cooking oil and genetically modified maize for stock feed in a bid to lower prices for average Zimbabweans. Kualamba Zimavungam, VUA News, Mangwe, Zimbabwe. While some Kenyans support President William Ruto's insistence on sending a police mission to Haiti, many others still wonder why the country wants to lead a multinational force aimed at helping quell violence and restore security, given that other nations that are more powerful and better equipped have not stepped forward. View in Nairobi Bureau Chief Mariama Diallo has more. Passions are running high in the streets of Nairobi, over possibly deploying the country's police to Haiti. Now why are you sending police instead of sending military to, for such a, such a such thing? That's my question. It does nothing because we're going to lose our beloved ones. Kenya, we don't have that power like the other countries like the United States. I think that's a noble idea because uh, we are human beings. Although people are complaining about uh, the procedure which has been used, we should urge the government of the day to at least follow the court orders. Let me conclude my remarks. President William Ruto, who recently signed a long-awaited bilateral accord with visiting Haitian Prime Minister Ariel Henry to pave the way for 1,000 Kenyan police officers to lead a proposed multinational UN-backed force that would help restore security in Haiti, insists it's the right thing to do. It is a mission for humanity. It is a mission in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Haiti. However, signing that accord was immediately followed by a fierce battle between Haitian police and armed gangs who blocked Henry's return to the Caribbean nation and eventually pushed the prime minister to say he will resign as soon as a transitional council is put in place.
Attorney Ikuru Okot was among a group that filed a petition before Kenya's high court that argued sending the country's police to Haiti was unconstitutional. He says the recent signing was misleading. First of all, it's a bogus agreement uh, because it has no legitimacy, uh, both in law and even on the person representing. Uh, Hariel Henry, for you to be able to enter into a contract, you must have capacity. To, to enter into a contract. And there are still problems whether this mission will go on or not because all the legal benchmarks have still not been satisfied, he says. When Jovenel Moise was killed in July 2021, Ariel Henry was only supposed to be in power for 120 days. For him to, be, to take over the role of a, a prime minister under the constitution of Haiti, he must be ratified, vetted by parliament and approved by parliament. He was never. So really the question then coming to the agreement, who is this who actually signed this agreement with the Republic of Kenya? George Musamali, a security consultant based in Nairobi, says it's time to rethink the Haitian issue. What people have not focused on is the reason for this turmoil for all these years. Remember, we started talking about trouble in Haiti in 1805 when they first declared independence from the French. To date, Haiti has not seen peace. So basically, the solutions that we've been putting on the table, are they working? There have been several unsuccessful interventions, including efforts by the United States and the United Nations. It's time to try something new, he says. Basically, what they were going to do is to deal with the same, same, same people we call gangs that they have America, the American intervention tried in, 20, in 1815, did not succeed. It tried again in uh, 1994, did not work. We tried again under the UN in uh, 2004 and it still did not work. With such a hostile and volatile situation now in Haiti, Musamawi says it's hard to envision that a military or a police intervention would work. Mariama Diallo, VOA News, Nairobi. Thousands of Haitians had been fleeing the country's economic and political instability even before the latest outbreak of gang violence. The first stop for many is South America, where some tried to work before heading for the U.S. VOA's Austin Landis met with one man on the Colombia-Panama border preparing to cross the treacherous Darien Gap. <laughs> Since Clifton Ariste left Haiti six years ago, his dream destination has always been the United States. My body, I feel good in my body when I'm speaking English. He learned English from listening to American rap music and recorded a music video himself while living in Chile. Ariste left Haiti in 2017 because he wanted an opportunity to make music and work and gangs were already tightening control of the country. You must be scared about going outside, going to buy something. You know, you don't, you don't want to leave. According to data from Panama's Migration Authority, Haitians are consistently among the top three nationalities that come to the Darien Gap on their way to the U.S. They often pass through this part of Colombia. Like Ariste, many first tried to work in Chile or Brazil before moving on once again. And the new outbreak of violence in Haiti's capital over the past month means more Haitian migrants could be on the way. Gangs now control most of Port-au-Prince. They have left bodies in the streets and persuaded the country's prime minister to resign. Infrastructure in Haiti has also taken a hit. The airport's not working, the docks are not working, the roads are blocked. People are just kind of like they're locked into their, their area of where they're living. According to Panamanian officials, more than 46,000 Haitians crossed the border from Colombia in 2023, and about 5,000 have already crossed this year. Ariste left Chile, saying it was hard to find work there. And he felt people in Chile discriminated against him because he's black. I got fear, I don't feel, I'm not, I don't have confidence, you know, because, wow, because they treat, they treat you like, and, and no, they don't treat you good. Well, they don't treat you well. He worries about his mom in Haiti, but he doesn't want to talk to her until he can offer help. Not because I don't love her. It's because I don't want to talk. I don't want to keep talking, talking, talking with this person now. So I just want to make action. I believe I want to be great to help my family. 
The latest figures from U.S. Customs and Border Protection show agents encountered more than 10,000 Haitians at the U.S.-Mexico border in January. Austin Landis, VOA News, Necocli, Colombia. Still to come, we'll have the latest U.S. presidential election news. Stay with us. watching VOS Red Carpet. My name is Jackson Vungani. Thank you so much for joining us each week right here on Red Carpet. We bring you the latest in. In other news, Nigerian police say at least four women were killed and one was injured in a stampede Sunday as crowds gathered to collect a cash handout in northern Nigeria. Women and children gathered outside the office of a wealthy businessman in Bauchi City to receive 5,000 naira, or $3.40, as a cash gift to help pay for food during Ramadan. Democratic Republic of Congo authorities say at least 11 people were killed on Sunday in twin attacks near Beni in eastern Congo. Officials say the attack was carried out by the Allied Democratic Forces rebel group. The ADF is one of the deadliest militias in the strife-torn area, and they pledged allegiance to the Islamic State group in 2019. And authorities in charge say they have barred 10 candidates, including two fierce opponents of the military regime, from running in the presidential election scheduled for May 6th. Ten other candidates remain in the race, most prominently the current junta leader, Mohamed Idris Deby, and his prime minister, success, Masra. Former U.S. President Donald Trump on Monday has won a bid to pause his $454 million civil fraud judgment if he posts a $175 million bond within 10 days. The court decision blocks New York state authorities from beginning to seize his assets. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden campaigned on his health care record over the weekend. VOA's politics and policy reporter Veronica Balderas Iglesias has more. After being found guilty of persistent fraud in his business practices, former President Donald Trump faced a Monday deadline to post a $454 million bond to a New York state court. Trump announced Friday via his Truth Social platform that he had the cash and repeated arguments he previously made in Palm Beach, Florida against the civil fraud case. This was a rigged trial by a crooked judge and a crooked attorney general, but they'd like to take the cash away so I can't use it on the campaign. The question of whether the witch hunt narrative could help Trump politically was posed to Democratic Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez interviewed Sunday on CNN's State of the Union. Has there ever been a president, Republican or Democrat, that has been subject to this level of criminal charges, indictments and investigations. This is not about party. This is not about politics. This is about corruption and criminality. Appearing on NBC's Meet the Press, the former chair of the Republican National Committee, Ronna McDaniel, commented on reports about a new joint fundraising committee between the RNC and the Trump campaign and whether it's appropriate for Trump to ask donors to pay for his legal bills.
if they feel strongly to support his legal bills, then they have every right to do so. And I think he's being very open that they're helping with his legal bill. Also in the race for a second term in the White House, U.S. President Joe Biden held a virtual rally Saturday, joined by his Democratic predecessor, Barack Obama, and House Speaker Emerita Nancy Pelosi. Biden focused on the topic of affordable health care. This election is about two different visions of America, as basic as that. My vision, our vision about the future, where folks have the freedom and security of affordable health care, low prescription drug costs, and just a little more breathing room, as my dad would say. Biden reassured voters he would preserve the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, and criticized Trump for vowing to dismantle it, even as around 20 million people have signed up for it this year alone. Veronica Valderas Iglesias, VOA News, Washington. In the past academic year, U.S. colleges and universities saw a nearly 30 percent increase in Ghanaian students, making Ghana one of the top 25 countries in the world for sending students to the United States. To accommodate the growing interest, the U.S. Embassy in Ghana has opened a new resource center for young people considering an American education. Sinanu Todd reports from Kumasi, Ghana. At Ghana's Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Kumasi, Marilyn Owusu addresses a group of students. Her goal is to inform them about the prospects of studying in the United States. Owusu, born and raised in Ghana, is a U.S. trained information systems professional. After she finished her studies in the United States, she returned home to start a business, which has been running for more than 20 years. She says her U.S. education was crucial to her success. Just by the nature of how their systems are shaped. So it empowers you to be able to take advantage of the systems in the U.S. to be able to become who you want to be. In 22 years, Owusu has helped more than a thousand Ghanaians pursue studies in the U.S. She consults for Education USA, a network of international student advising centers sponsored by the U.S. Department of State in more than 175 countries. Owusu says American universities use this network to enroll students from Ghana every year. All schools in the U.S. recognize Education USA. We are able to bring them to Ghana to be able to talk to all students. Um, we are able to assure them that we can coordinate programs for schools in the U.S. So they come and they are dependent on us to be able to give them good programs as to how they can relate to Ghanaian students. According to the U.S. Embassy in Ghana, in the past academic year, Ghanaian students' enrollment in U.S. colleges and universities increased by nearly 32 percent, and Ghana became the 14th largest sender of graduate students to the country. The introduction of free high school education in Ghana in 2017 has significantly increased the number of graduates, positioning Ghana as an attractive hub for American universities to target prospective students. To help accommodate the growing numbers, the U.S. Embassy has moved to open a new educational research center for students interested in studying in the U.S. The center, called the American Corner, serves as a hub for Northern Ghana to connect to the U.S. through American literature, media, and educational materials. We have databases that are paid for by the State Department. They are free of charge. We can give you access remotely, and then you can come in here to use it. There are books, and apart from the library, normal library services that we offer, we do programming all year round. The programs include educational counseling, cultural events, and entrepreneurship training. The embassy says these programs and activities are part of the U.S. strategies to foster mutual understanding and strengthen its relationships with Ghana. We have a really wonderful uh, relationship that's continuing across all sectors, and at the heart of that is the people to people. So when we talk about our exchanges, we're not just exchanging people going to the U.S. and coming back here. It's about ideas and concepts and shared experiences. There are about 600 American corners and similar venues worldwide providing programs and events that aim to enhance cultural, educational, and professional exchanges with the United States. Sana Nutod, VOA News, Kumasi, Ghana. 
The Nigerian film industry, often referred to as Nollywood, is the second largest movie maker in the world in terms of volume and is making strides both in terms of art and popularity at the box office. Timothée Obiezu reports from Abuja. Nigerian filmmaker Paul Cast is putting the finishing touches to his latest movie, Just the Two of Us. The project is due for release in April and Cast says he's hoping it will hit big. The storyline was mainly around a couple and um, how they were able to go through their journeys and um, go through lots of highs and lows, mainly trying to typify the kind of struggle that could come in when people are in relationships. A former psychology student, Cast launched his movie career in 2019. In terms of output, Nigeria's film industry, or Nollywood, is the second largest in the world behind India's Bollywood producing over a thousand movies annually. In December, the Nigerian movie A Tribe Called Judah became the first movie to earn 1 billion naira, equivalent to about $1.1 million at the domestic box office. Tribe Called Judah cast member Olumido Wari says the movie about a single mother and her five sons struggling to make ends meet is a common Nigerian story. I think everybody that saw the movie just saw a bit of themselves in terms of just wanting to do whatever it takes for your mom to be happy and comfortable. Cast says the success of the movie Lionheart, directed by Genevieve Inaji, which became the first Nigerian film to stream on Netflix in 2019, also inspired filmmakers. We actually didn't have avenues of distribution like that, but ever since um, Genevieve came up and did Lion's Heart, and it just opened up you know, the door to Netflix and other, other streaming platforms, it just made people see possibilities. But filmmakers say access to funding is still a challenge and want Nigerian government and financial institutions to invest more in the movie industry. There's been improvements in the cinematics, the cinematography, the lighting, so there are more opportunities, sound design. As opposed to before when it was just, you know, get a camera, you have a story, you point and you shoot. And the result and the growing market is good news for filmmakers like Paul Cast and millions of Nigerians who are waiting to see the next big film on their screens. Timothy Obiezu, VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. Now, waiters carried their trays across the streets of Paris Sunday as the city revived its historic Café Waiters' race after a 13 years hiatus. About 200 waiters from various cafes across the city participated. They were tasked with carrying a tray with a croissant, a cup of coffee, and a glass of water on it along a two-kilometer route. A few rules applied, no running, no spilling of water, and only one hand to hold the Tray. The winners were awarded gastronomic outings and tickets to the Paris Olympics opening ceremony. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching.